city of Mexico. Population, five and a half million. Next year, nearly half a million more. Center of progress for a nation of 35 million. In the last 10 years, exports, electric power, steel production, all have multiplied three times, four times, 11 times. More time now for more people, a better chance for education, a great university built by Mexicans. This generation can extend its horizon. There is pride, confidence in the future. In most of Latin America, there is a better prospect for more people. But in every country, the landscape still shows two faces. This community doesn't know much about steel production or electric power or exports. They know about other things, poverty, hunger, disease. Theirs is not much of a horizon. The people here ask questions. What will her future be? Part of the answer will come from the land. A basic fact shapes the lives of most of our neighbors below the Rio Grande. This fact has long concerned the Rockefeller Foundation and its president, Dr. J. George Harar. Much, if not in most of the world, farming is still today a traditional way of life. Unfortunately, however, in too many countries, from 50 to 70 percent of the farm families have to till the soil in order to feed themselves and the other families not engaged in agricultural practice. Improvements in farm practice are vital if a larger proportion of society is to have an opportunity to carry out individual initiative and enterprise toward developing better standards of living. These improvements must, of course, of necessity, come initially, most basically, from the people themselves, with the help and guidance of government and educational institutions. However, on occasions, it is possible for a specialist from other countries to be of assistance in accelerating progress and contributing to improvements if there is mutual respect and understanding of common objectives. When a scientist comes to another country to help solve its problem, he must become a student. The classroom, Mexico. The student, Dr. Edwin J. Wellhausen, his lesson in his own words. Yeah, well, let me tell you what happened to me when I uh, first came down here in 1943. I thought I knew all about growing corn. I was fresh from the state of Iowa, where uh, I suppose more corn is grown than in any place in the world in the same uh, size uh, of area. I uh, wanted to speed up things. So I went into the state of Morelos and rented uh, some land and started to work. Uh, we took a uh, tractor and uh, other pieces of uh, farm implements along with us to prepare the land in order to get moisture into the soil while we irrigated it. Uh, we throwed it out and then we planted our seed in these furrows. As we dropped each seed while we uh, covered the seed by uh, shoving dirt uh, on top of it with their feet. This uh, 
left a, uh, a nice loose cover of soil, uh, left it in a condition which I thought was ideal for germinating. A number of times while we were doing this, the uh, man that did all the work around there, he came, he came by and he kept saying, well, you can't plant corn this way. And I said, what do you mean? You can't plant corn this way. He says, it won't grow. Well, you know, uh, we waited about 10 days, and only one plant here and there, separated by as much as 10, 20 feet, appeared in the whole field that we planted. And he came back when I was uh, looking over the field and uh, shook his head. He said, let me show you how to plant this stuff. So I said, all right, I, I'm going to plant the seed that I have left just exactly like you tell me how to do it. So what did he do? He got out his uh, team of oxen. We went over to an adjacent piece of land and started to work. First thing he did was made a furrow with this old Egyptian plow. Made a furrow about three inches deep, four inches deep, and about three inches wide, something like that. Okay, he put the seed in that furrow. Then he came along and made another furrow right along the side of it. It's close enough to where, uh, as he went along, the dirt from his Egyptian plow pushed over or fell over on the uh, seed that we had planted. Now, he said, we'll run water down this furrow, this last furrow I made. Okay, we planted the whole field in this fashion. Ten days later, it had a perfect stand. Every grain in that field came up, just as beautiful as could be. I said, what's, what's the trouble here? Why didn't my uh, method work? I scratched around in the soil, and I found that all the seeds that didn't germinate, which were 99% of them, had been destroyed by insects in the area, had crawled through this loose soil, gotten to the seed as it swelled, as it began to germinate, and ate the germ out. Now, the method that he used prevented the insects from getting down to the seed because by irrigating after the seed was planted, the water melted down, the clods closed up all the space between the top of the soil and the seed, and the insects didn't get down there, and the stuff germinated and came up fine. I learned rather quickly that in a new area, that is, in an area in which I knew little uh, or nothing about, it was better to follow the systems or methods which the farmers used in that area. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that in technical assistance, it is very important that one first learns why the farmer does what he does. Once having learned this, then uh, it is possible very often to make very slight changes, and through these very slight changes, make tremendous advances or gains in production. Work with corn in this land and you'll learn much of the land's history and culture. Centuries ago, temples were raised to Quetzalcoatl, the god who was said to be the discoverer of corn. His discovery nourished ancient civilizations. It was carved into their images. Mayan, Incan, Aztec. Corn spread to the Indians of the north and south. It was a magic grain, grown or withheld at the will of the gods. The bones and blood of each generation nourished the crops on which depended the lives of all who followed. time of the Spanish conquistadores, the magic grain became a holy grain. Where once there was Aztec sacrifice, today there is festival. The festival of San Isidro, patron saint of agriculture. For the plow, fertile soil. 
with the seeds, rain, and sun. These things are prayed for. If the prayers are answered, the people, the animals, the whole community will live another year. A major reason for corn's importance in this land. Far more than other crops, it can be planted on the mountainside, in the tropics, on the plateau. Its growth and harvest in harmony with seasons and weather. But in this century, the hard-won harvest began to fall behind the growing population. Exhaustion of the soil, old ways of cultivation, insects and disease. These reduced the land's yield. If a crop failed, a community faced disaster. Today's yields are higher, and there are other crops. But two-thirds of the people still get their basic food from corn. tortilla, age-old, unchanging rhythm. Most of the people chained to the soil by a primitive agriculture. As the population increased, greater yields, healthier crops became necessary. In 1943, action was taken by Mexican government leaders including the Minister of Agriculture at that time, His Excellency Don Marte R. Gomez. Oblige us to think in providing our countrymen with corn, wheat, and other essential badly needed in Mexico. At that moment, we have organized the production of the Mexican agriculture in the best possible way. We have been running for years our land reform, but we need to complement it with a agricultural revolution. To initiate that properly, we need badly technical assistance. To provide technical assistance, a few agricultural specialists were sent from the Rockefeller Foundation technical assistance, you must build your improvements on the basic material you find on the spot. The essential first step, research. The collection of existing corn types. From Michoacan, from Veracruz, from every region of Mexico. This work was repeated in later programs established in Colombia and India. The corn they found was tough adapted to a primitive agriculture. Sturdy stuff, to which science could add the promise of more abundant yield. From the very first, along with research, went training, a sharing of growing knowledge. In time, teachers and trainees have come to know the land's different regions each with its own type of corn, its own kind of people. Corn originated in this land. Some of the varieties they have collected bear close resemblance to prehistoric types. has been studied for its strength and its weakness. In Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil, the corn is stored at experiment stations set up under the program. The seed of these varieties is deposited in corn germplasm banks, treasuries of genetic material for breeding better corn. Under refrigeration, the corn germplasm can be kept for years as living seed capable of growing. From this stock, the corn breeders can select combinations as a basis for creating better and better varieties. The result of nature guided by man, a hybrid corn, higher yielding, more resistant to drought and disease. 
At other stations in Mexico, Colombia, and India, they gather the hybrid seed for distribution to the farmers. Greater quantity as well as quality. One of the world's basic food crops, transformed by technical assistance into a better staple for a larger population. Agricultural scientists, a major goal of the men who began the program. A contribution summed up by the Colombian government's director of agricultural research, Dr. Canuto Cardona. I think that the most important thing they leave behind is the people that they have trained, people that have been trained here in the country, and people that have, have gone outside the country to get some extra education. Uh, I have been associated with a program in which we have established a, a double-way flow of people, people trained com coming from the states to give us assistance in agricultural research. Research must focus on protection as well as greater yield. Local technicians are trained under the program to probe the enemies that feed on crops. The enemy of wheat is rust. Until recently, it limited the successful cultivation of wheat in Mexico and Colombia. Rust devastated the crop in whole areas at a time. The biology of this deadly fungus had to be explored. Its effects had to be counteracted. At an experiment station established under the program, wheat breeders have undertaken a never-ending process of hybridizing, testing, selecting. The objective of their experiments, single hybrid grains that can be multiplied. In working toward their goal, the wheat breeders have cataloged thousands of types. Endless screening and reselection result in the isolation of seed that holds the promise of resistance to rust the promise of a higher yield and better quality. Some of the wheat is harvested for distribution to the farmers. Some of it is stored for future breeding here and in other countries. Dr. Ignacio Navarez, leader in wheat breeding, trained under the program Dr. Norman Borlaug, plant pathologist, compare the grain from rust-free and rust-infected lines. Thousands of acres of wheat can now flourish in areas where once even small patches could barely exist. The new varieties can utilize solar energy, soil fertility, and moisture far more efficiently. This land has gained a new abundance of a vital food. Another enemy, late blight of potatoes. Potatoes originated in these lands ages ago, along with the world's most virulent races of late blight. This battle is the job of a team headed by Dr. John S. Niederhauser. These potatoes are growing in the Toluca Valley, which is proud of the potatoes, which is the most important disease of potatoes in the world. Over a period of several years, we have selected potatoes which will survive in this environment, in this valley, and have grown them and increased them with the idea of trying to find a potato that can be grown during the rainy season here and not have any uh, 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 serious effects from late blight. This variety, Alpha, we use as a Czech variety. And as you can see, the late blight has completely killed the foliage, has attacked the stems, and is leaving only the, what you might call the remains of the plant 
above ground, and below there are no tubers, and the yield is uh, essentially uh, uh, none. On the other hand, the new variety here, which was developed in Mexico, its foliage is still green. It has resisted the attack of the Phytophthora, or the late blight fungus. It will produce a good uh, uh, crop of tubers, and it still has several months uh, to uh, uh, produce starch in the foliage and pass that down to the tubers, and will produce, say, six or eight nice-sized tubers of good shape, which can be used by the farmer either for the uh, for feeding his own family or a portion of it which can be sold on a small scale in the local markets. The result of long and careful experimentation hand in hand with training. New areas opened up where potatoes can be grown reliably. <laughs> This crop can also be grown by the farmer in his kitchen garden. Nine new blight-resistant varieties of potatoes are available. All can be saved through the winter for planting again. Another basic food crop now available for more of the people. Variety in the family diet. In wheat production, cooperative research has produced new varieties of rust-resistant wheat, adapted to different growing seasons different altitudes and different uses. Mexico can now produce enough for her own people. It is a two-way flow of benefit. Wheat research in Mexico, Colombia, and Chile is helping to advance the work of wheat breeders on every continent. Progress in corn, the most traditional and largest staple. Over 50 improved varieties and hybrids are now produced in Mexico, Colombia, and India. This harvest is a promise for the future, a source of pride for the people of Latin America, an important reason for their growing participation in building a healthier world community. Improved corn in the hands of the farmer end result of years of research and experimentation, of training. A former trainee is now one of the men who are directing important research units, Dr. Eduardo Alvarez. It is a great satisfaction for us Mexicans to learn that this same germplasm has been and is used at present in other regions of the world for the development of uh, improved varieties and hybrids of higher productivity. In countries such as Central and South America, in India, Indonesia, and in many African countries. The most important harvest. Under the Agricultural Sciences Program, 600 graduates of Mexican agricultural colleges have received practical or in-service training. Some graduates have received postgraduate training here at Chapingo or abroad through fellowships provided by the foundation. Many former students are now teaching the new generation to take over the program's work. The foundation's agricultural program is liquidating itself. Soon this land will be on its own. But it must produce more scientists and technicians. The farmers want information. They must get it from their own people. The Foundation's program is supplying improved materials and information. It is helping to demonstrate methods that have been worked out here to fit these men and their land. But the training job must be completed by the people of the land themselves. This is the focal point, the ultimate target of technical assistance, the family that must be helped before too late, the family of a man like Elicio Venegas. What we need here is improvement in land matters. We have too little land for farming. We don't have enough to support our children. 
I need help for the older girls. I want them to learn to be seamstresses or learn any other skill by which they can live. I have not enough to support them. Also, I need something for the children. I can't keep them in school as I should. No hay suficiente. There isn't enough. Through research, experimentation, training, there is a chance to change this way of existence. The battle is not lost, but it isn't won. This child is starving from protein deficiency. Even though he and the others here were born in a valley that could be one of the most productive in the world. The battle isn't won. The world's conscience demands that something be done. How to do it faster? That takes time and keeping at it. The result of continuity, of time well used. For the last 10 years, agricultural production in Mexico has been increasing more than twice as fast as the population. This is the product of education and research, the achievement of men who are free to work together. One of the men who is proving the worth of cooperative technical assistance is Minister of Agriculture of the Government of Mexico, His Excellency Don Julian Rodriguez Adame. Thanks to individual training, including the sending of Mexicans to study at the best agricultural institutions in the United States, we now have a technical corps that can compete at the highest professional level with agricultural technicians anywhere in the world. For us in Mexico, this is the meaning of international cooperation. In this case, between the Rockefeller Foundation and the federal government of Mexico. The cost of the foundation's program, $20 million in 19 years. The results reach around the world. Similar programs in Colombia, Chile, India. New inter-American programs for the entire hemisphere. A rice program in the Philippines for the whole Far East. To this land have come trainees from the Middle East, from Africa and Asia. They are carrying home the knowledge of what research, experimentation and training can achieve. Technical assistance, if soundly conceived and genuinely cooperative, can help a land to help itself. In this land, many young people were once chained to the soil. Today, many can move on to other tasks, of industry to the profession, of the arts and sciences. These are the descendants of a revolution that overthrew the conquistadores. Today, they are part of an even greater revolution against the tyranny of poverty, hunger, and disease. Today, on the land or in the town, his freedom can be fulfilled.